Remember, Roman, you rule the nations with your sway. These will be your talents, to impose law and order in peace, to spare the conquered, and to war down the arrogant. That is how the Roman poet Virgil, in his epic The Aeneid, formulates the claim of the Roman Empire to absolute dominion over the peoples of the earth. Two thousand years on, grass and undergrowth run wild over the last traces of the Limes. Rome's border with the barbarians. At the beginning of the first century AD, the Roman Empire had recovered from chaos and civil war and regained its unity and military strength. Its victorious legions in North Africa and on the Danube and the Rhine gave Rome an aura of invincibility. But even so, the Romans began to establish borders over a distance of 7,000 kilometers. Between the Rhine and the Danube, the Limes bounded the provinces of Germania Superior and Rhaetia to the east and the north. At first, the Limes was nothing more than a line of posts. In the middle of the second century, however, in a massive demonstration of power, it was developed into an impressive frontier system. In the northeast of the Roman Empire, the course of the Limes was determined by the Danube. An important trade and traffic route, the river linked the Black Sea with Central Europe. In Castra Regina, modern-day Regensburg, the river frontier was guarded by a legion of 5,000 men. Further south, near the Danube Gorge, just past Weltenburg at a tiny hamlet called Harderfleck, Roman surveyors sent the Limes branching off westwards in a straight line over land. After the final phase of construction, more than 900 watchtowers guarded the 550 kilometers between the Danube and the Rhine. Today, only fragments remain of the solid wall, up to four meters high, which linked Roman watchtowers in the province of Rhaetia. With its white limestone plaster and red pointing, the wall was an impressive demonstration of civilization. The tribes on the other side of it only knew how to build with wood. Even in the Middle Ages, there was only one explanation for the remains of the puzzling structure. The Devil's Wall, as it was called, could only be the work of the Antichrist. The soldiers in the watchtowers were in visual contact with one another. In the event of incursions by the barbarians, by lighting flares or blowing their horns, they could alert rapid reaction troops in the hinterland, who then cut off the invaders' retreat. Direct defense of the frontier lay in the hands of the auxilia. As the name indicates, auxiliary troops who were billeted in over 120 camps of varying size close to the Limes, like the Castrum Sablonitum, a small fort on the western edge of the Franconian Jura. The Castrum Sablonitum was built some four kilometers in advance of the Stasio Biricianis, a large cavalry fort whose rectangular layout can still be seen quite clearly in the townscape of Weissenburg. Billeted here was the Ala Hispanorum Ariana, a combat effective unit of 500 cavalrymen, which was originally formed in Spain. Excavation work has shown that a further 1,000 troops, a cohort with foot soldiers and cavalry, was also stationed in Weissenburg. It also brought to light what is the biggest baths complex ever found on the Limes, the cold bathroom, the warm and hot bathrooms, and the sudatorium, the sweating room, were used not only by troops, but also by the inhabitants of the adjacent Vicus, the village belonging to the fort. 
Their trade and handicrafts thrived, and for a few asses, wine and service from the fairer sex were available. While much regarding life amongst the Teutons remains shrouded in mystery, Roman finds in the form of household goods, tools and weapons indicate an ancient advanced civilization which also appreciated good food. Dishes made with sophisticated seasoning, dates and rice from the Orient, olive oil and wine imported in amphoras from Italy. The Teutons, on the other hand, drank beer. They knew nothing about baths, stone buildings or urbane life. For Rome, the Limes marked the boundary between civilization and barbarity. Its well-trained soldiers were not only masters of military skills, they also tilled fields, cut aisles hundreds of kilometers long through the forests and established a vast frontier system. Of the highest artistic quality and fashioned with the finest handicraft skills, these statuettes of gods are part of the Roman treasure found in Weissenburg. The precious inventory of a temple, it was probably buried as people fled from one of the major Teutonic invasions that occurred in the middle of the 3rd century AD. Up to then, the Romans had proved largely successful in pacifying the frontier. Their tightly organized army was considerably more than a match for the Teutons. A network of scouts warned of attacks. Revolts were put down with the utmost severity. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was implemented by force. Yet even today, scholars still puzzle over whether the Limes fulfilled other purposes in addition to securing the frontier militarily. For instance, modern researchers see the border fortifications primarily as a cleverly devised monitoring and communication system, created not only to control trade and commerce, but also, indeed first and foremost, to limit immigration. The limes as the outer boundary of Roman prosperity. The fort in Arlen was of great strategic importance. For a long time, the Arla Secunda Flavia Miliaria, with its 1,000 cavalrymen, was the most combat effective unit in the Roman province of Risha. The foundation walls of the headquarters building are all that remains of the biggest cavalry camp north of the Alps. Thanks to modern computer technology, however, researchers have been able to reproduce the huge fort. Its fortifications included four large gates, each with two openings guarded on either side by towers. Measuring 277 meters by 214, the clearly structured camp with its purely functional layout was of impressive external dimensions. Located at the centre of the complex was the Principia, the headquarters building. The commander enjoyed the highest rank in the cavalry. Under him were 1,000 highly paid and superbly equipped mounted soldiers, each of whom had two horses, so as to be ready for action at all times. These elite troops performed mainly tactical tasks, like long-range reconnaissance, but they also carried out reprisal attacks in the area beyond the Limes. By comparison, everyday life out on the Limes must by and large have been extremely dreary. Part of the Roman demarcation line with stockade, ditch, embankment and a stone watchtower has been reconstructed in impressive style on the Heidenbuckel, one of the highest hills on the upper Germanic Limes. Sentry teams of between three and eight men were left to their own devices in the towers for days, often weeks on end. 
The auxiliary forces along the Limes were recruited mainly from the peoples the Romans had subjugated. The reward that beckoned for 25 years hard service was Roman citizenship. Little remains of Europe's biggest archaeological monument. Many roads and district boundaries still follow the course of the Limes exactly. But over many centuries, the embankment and the ditch were levelled by ploughs, while the stones in the wall were welcome building material. With so much shrouded in mystery, mankind felt a need to create the most concrete picture possible of the Limes and its era. The best example of this is the Saalburg fort in the Taunus Hills near Frankfurt. Reconstruction of the fort, where in the Limes era a cohort of 500 soldiers was based, stemmed directly from a German emperor's keen interest in ancient Rome. As a youth, Kaiser Wilhelm II had avidly followed excavation work on the site of the ruins. Years later, in 1897, he announced his decision to have the fort rebuilt. Private scholars had engaged in archaeological research on the Limes even in the humanist period. But it was not until the 19th century that science began to focus on the legacy of ancient Rome. Historical and archaeological societies were formed. And in 1871, under the overall control of the Imperial Limes Commission, systematic excavation work got underway amongst other places in the area around the Saalburg and the nearby borderline. His Majesty Kaiser Wilhelm II kept a close eye on how the excavation work was progressing. Indeed, the last German emperor took a personal hand in the Saalburg project, canvassing support and collecting money for the reconstruction work and in Louis Jacobi he found just the right architect. But it wasn't only a love of archaeology and history that drew Wilhelm to the Saalburg. The project was also a propaganda tool. After all, it enabled the imperial power of ancient Rome to be linked to the imperial claims of the Wilhelminian epoch in a very special way. The Roman fort in the Taunus Hills caused a stir at home and abroad, and quickly became a major public attraction. In 1904, it served as the venue for the first international car race on German soil. The stands were decorated in ancient Roman style. The gods so will that Rome should become the capital of the world. Therefore, let them cultivate the art of war, and let them know, and so hand it down to posterity, that no human power can withstand the Roman arms. Words written by Livy, the Roman historian who lived during the reign of Augustus, the first godlike Roman emperor. In order to safeguard the supremacy of the Roman Empire, his successors had the Rhetian Upper Germanic Limes built. Following large-scale attacks by the Alemannians in the middle of the 3rd century AD, the 550 kilometer long demarcation line had to be abandoned. The empire had been weakened by internal strife. Its troops were no longer a match for the invaders, nor was the Limes constructed for such engagements. Just like the many powers that came after them, the Romans had to accept the fact that stone always endures longer than dominion.